Father, we love you. We're so thankful that you came, that you became one of us, that you were uh, willing to take on flesh and, and feel the pain uh, and, and understand the pain of humanity in a way that um, it, it's just unfathomable uh, for us to to understand. But but you did that, Lord, and, and you're touched with the feelings of our infirmity. You know what it's like to feel pain. You know what it's like to be helpless. You know what it's like to be weak. You're the king of the universe, and yet you did that voluntarily. You took that on. And, and Lord, that's what we celebrate this time of year. Uh, we pray for those who are feeling lonely, for those who are feeling isolated. And I know there's some watching this right now that are at home, and they've been feeling lonesome and, and isolated. And I just lift them up to you, Lord. And I pray that your presence there will be with them right in this moment, and they will feel your presence with them, Lord. They'll, they'll know your great love for them. And Lord, help us um, to, to look for people uh, and reach out to those who, who are lonesome and, and isolated during this time. And so, Father, I just, I just ask your anointing upon this service. Um, I pray for our missionaries, Lord. I lift them up to you. As, as I say that word missionary, several faces come to my mind, the faces that I love, faces that I know, faces that, that you love and know, and you know right where they are and you know right what they need. And so I, I pray for them right now. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you will, again, uh, just come down and, and invade those spaces where they are with your presence and your power. Lord, anoint, anoint this message. Uh, may it say what you want to say. May your words be in my mouth today. Your thoughts be in my head. And I know that's a miracle, too. And I'm just so thankful that you do it. Um, and I love you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to continue in this series called The Thrill of Hope. This is number three in that series. We've been thinking together and talking together about how the birth narratives of Christ um, sort of foreshadow. They have this sort of prophetic um, tint to them. They have these little threads woven into them that reveal. Don't you love the way God puts clues in Scripture for us to find? He puts he puts that like he like Jesus said about the kingdom of God is like a pearl hidden in a field, and a man will spend everything he's got to, to find that pearl, a treasure. Uh, and he does that in Scripture. He, he hides these little pearls of wisdom. He hides these little pearls of prophecy. Um, he hides these little pearls of confirmation that confirm other scriptures so that we can know, oh, wow, we see how this came to pass and how this is true. And so we can have faith and confidence that, that the Bible is true. He hides those things in scripture. And, and we see that in this birth narrative. He's woven these little threads in there uh, that show us uh, these times, these times in history when God intervened and light broke into the darkness and he changed everything. The thrill of hope, this great hope that's in this story for this weary world who so needs to hear it right now. In Isaiah 9, when, when he was talking about the birth of Christ, I, Isaiah 9 is where that we, we often hear this time of year, unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given. Um, just a few verses before that, Isaiah 9, 1 talks about a people walking in darkness. have seen a great light. Oh, a people living in a land of darkness, the light has dawned. Don't you love the way Isaiah puts that, how he, how he speaks that? Uh, what a great description of this this time when God intervened and, and the Word became flesh and, and this uh, incarnation of Christ becoming one of us. The Creator God actually moving into creation and becoming a part of creation. I think that's a part of what John meant when he said he came to his own, but his own received him not. He came to his own creation, even though he was the Creator and the rest of his, his, his created um, humans, the pinnacle of his creation, didn't even know who he was. But since the fall of man and since the coming of sin into to the, to the world, into the coming of the curse, God has been heaven bent on this mission of reversing the curse and redeeming all things, redeeming his fallen creation. And as we've gone through the scriptures this year, we've seen that plan progressively revealed. We've seen how God first told us it was going to be the seed of the woman, and then he narrowed it down. And we saw all those times where he again wove that thread, that clue in, into scripture of what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. And we've seen it play out over, over the, 
the centuries, over the generations uh, of this family that God has chosen. It progressively revealed to us. And now in this birth narrative, we see sort of the pinnacle of that. We see the coming of the Messiah. Hallelujah. We, we join with the angels who were filled with joy and who, who rejoice. And th they kind of knew probably more at that moment than anybody else did. What was happening? The plan of redemption was coming to earth. <clears throat> Last week, I, I mentioned that, that I needed a bigger understanding of redemption. I needed a bigger revelation about uh, what redemption is and who the Redeemer is and all that he's going to redeem. I needed, I needed, um, I needed my theology of redemption to be, the, my tent pegs to be stretched. Amen. And I think maybe we all do. It's not just a ticket to heaven. Redemption is not just a ticket to heaven. Redemption is so much more. He is redeeming all things. Turn to your neighbor and say all things. Humanity. Yeah, he's, he's redeeming humanity. And each individual human, we kind of covered that last week, how every part of our humanity was marred and scarred by sin. And in his plan of redemption, he's reversing the curse on every single aspect of our humanity as an individual. But let's widen that out. He's going to redeem even more than individual humans. He's going to redeem the earth. He's going to redeem the nations. He's going to redeem the governments. He's going to redeem all things. He's even going to redeem the relationships that the animals have with each other. They Right? Um, the lion will lay down with the lamb and the wolf um, and the ox and, and, and even the little child can play with a poisonous snake and it won't bite him. Even all, all every relationship, uh, even the plants uh, that have thorns, right? Uh, that's even going to be redeemed. He's going to redeem everything. And he's in, in, the, in the process of doing all of that. And so uh, that's what I want us to, to kind of think about as we're, we're celebrating Christmas. Just how big of a plan and an idea that God is, is bringing to pass. So we, we've begun looking at ways, at places in this Christmas story in this birth narrative that God began to foreshadow um, what he was going to do with the death and resurrection of Christ and then what he would do at the second coming of Christ. Uh, we've seen how that was foreshadowed in the angelic announcements to both Joseph and Mary. Uh, the prophetic pronouncements by Simeon and Anna that happened when when Mary and Joseph took him to the temple eight days later, and 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 both they both gave these prophetic announcements about how he would he would be the one who fulfilled uh, this messianic role, this kingship, and how it would come to pass that it would be very painful uh, for Mary, um, and, and in ways I'm sure that nobody who was standing there really understood. But God was telling us He was He was foreshadowing it, even in the swaddling clothes. We talked about that last week that He was wrapped in. Today I want to look at that third piece. We talked about the three, the three, three, three times, right? The birth of Christ, the death and, re and resurrection of Christ, and then when He comes again. I've been thinking about that word Maranatha. Maranatha was a it was a word that was um, passed as a greeting sometimes in the early church. The Maranatha cry. I think I think the the church has largely lost. Um, the Maranatha cry, but the Maranatha cry is a cry from our heart. Maranatha means, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. And I was thinking about that relationship between Maranatha and Merry Christmas, uh, and how those, we, we pass that as a greeting, don't we? We say Merry Christmas, we say it to uh, believers, we say it to people at, at the store, we say it to people who were uh, who are helping us, uh, serving us in some way, and when we give them a, a tip or something, or we give them a gift, and we say, Merry Christmas. Um, it's, it's just a very natural thing for us to say Merry Christmas. And, and maybe I just want to link those two things together for you in your minds. Merry Christmas and Merry Nantha. Merry Nantha. Uh, come, Lord Jesus. The, the coming of Christ uh, the first time, was Merry Christmas, the coming of Christ the second time. We, we wait for it. We hope for it. We long for it. He's going, he's going to come. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. And I want to look at, at some of the ways in, the, in that birth narrative 
that that's foreshadowed for us, something that's uh, <clears throat> going to come to pass in the not too distant future. Um, in the book of Matthew, we we read some of that last week. We read the the uh, the angelic vision or angelic visitation, really, of the the angel Gabriel to Matthew uh, to to Joseph, and Matthew records that. And right after that. Uh, Matthew doesn't doesn't tell us anything about the journey to Bethlehem or the innkeeper or the shepherds or Jesus being born or the manger. He skips over all that. So right after, at the end of Matthew 1, we have the angel telling Matthew, telling Joseph, I'm sorry, the angel telling Joseph, you're going to call his name Jesus. Um, and so that's the end of Matthew 1. And then Matthew 2 opens with, with after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So we immediately jump to um, the coming of the wise men in, in Matthew's gospel narrative. And he says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And so we get this narrative of the wise men. Now, before I read it to you, I want to talk to you a little bit about it. Because there's a lot of uh, things we don't know about this wise man story. And there's a lot of sort of popular... Uh, mythology that has developed around them like they were kings, which the Bible doesn't say that they were kings. It says they were magi, wise men. Um, magi is used in the book of Daniel. In fact, Daniel himself was a magi. He was the chief of the magi. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also a part of this group of wise men. They were advisors to the king uh, of that area at that time. And that area continued, that, <clears throat> that area did not fall to Rome. That area uh, maintained some autonomy um, amongst the Persians. The Persian rulers were still ruling in that area by the time Jesus came. And so those, those prophecies that Daniel had given way back, um, you know, 500 years prior, um, they, they were still looked at and studied by this group of, of leaders in this country. So that's who these guys were. Now, that's who they were. Why did they come? What were they doing? There, there's some uh, questions there. Was the star in the east or was the star in the west, right? Because First Noel says, uh, we uh, shining brightly in the east. Um, but We Three Kings says, westward leading, still proceeding. So which was it? Was the star in the east or in the west? We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, why did they come? We'll talk about that. Um, did the star appear two years before Jesus was born? Because, you know, when they talk to Herod, they say it, it appeared two years ago. That's why he makes the order to slaughter the babies uh, up to, or, or, or did the star appear when Jesus was born? And the Magi are coming two years later. Well, some of these questions we don't have answers to. We can, we can um, make some educated guesses and I'll give you what mine are. Um, did the star move or was it at a, in a static location? How did that work? Um, and something else, and the reason why I wanted to talk about the wise men today was there might just be some hidden prophecy, some hidden foreshadowing, some of those little threads woven into this story that God is telling us what he's going to do in the future. So let me read it to you. Uh, Matthew 2, beginning with verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, why did they come to Jerusalem? Well, they came to Jerusalem because they were looking for the king of the Jews. They were looking for the Messiah. They knew he was going to be born. Um, and so they came to the capital. And they came to the, the, the palace of Herod. And they asked, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Now, that's where some of the confusion comes out about whether the star was in the, shining in the east or shining in the west. Well, when they say we saw his star in the east, they're, they're saying we, we saw his star when we were in the east. When we were back east, back east over by Persia, we saw his star. And so we've come west. And that doesn't even really mean that the star was in the west. It just means we saw a new star in the sky and we knew what that new star meant. It meant there was a king of the Jews that had been born. So we came west to Jerusalem. 
It could have been north, south, east. I don't know where it was in the constellation, but it was in the constellations where they could see it and they knew what it meant. Now, how did they knew, know what it meant? They knew what it meant because in Daniel chapter 10, which is the, the chapter where Daniel gives the prophecy of the 77s, he says after 69 sevens, the anointed one will come. 69 sevens is 483 years. So these guys kept track and they knew it was time for this anointed one to come. And so when they saw the star, they, they realized that's what this mean, must mean. It must mean that this one who Daniel told us was going to come has been born. And so they came looking for him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with you. If you remember last week, I said he had married a Jewish wife so that he could lay claim to the Davidic uh, covenant promise, perhaps, for his children. Um, and so he was disturbed. And he called together the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. And he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, about 10 miles, 7 miles uh, south and east of Jerusalem is Bethlehem, not far. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd of my people Israel. He, the, the chief priests and the, the elders quote Micah 5, uh, and they know that that's where um, the one who's going to fulfill this Davidic covenant, this Davidic uh, dynasty is going to come from the city of David. He will be a son of David. That's where he will come from. Um, and so they tell Herod, Bethlehem. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may worship him. Of course, he's lying. He doesn't have any intention of worshiping the new king. He has an intention of slaughtering and killing this king so he can main, so he can have the dynasty for his family. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east, or the star they had seen when they were east, now here's, here's a, a part that's very interesting, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. So while the star probably had not moved in the sky uh, for however many months or years that they had been coming and seen it to get to Jerusalem. Now, as they left Bethlehem, the star did move, and it led them right to where Jesus was. Now, where was Jesus? Was he still in Bethlehem, or had they gone back to Nazareth? We don't know for sure. There's many people who think that they went to Nazareth, even though Herod had sent them to Bethlehem. Um, the star led them someplace else, and maybe the star, the star could have led them to Nazareth, I, I, for one, think that they were still in Bethlehem, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, at the end of this story, um, they go to Egypt, and then when they come back from Egypt, here's what it says. I'm going to jump ahead, then I'll come back. This is verse 19. So they go to Egypt, then they're going to come back. Verse 19, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and he took the child and his mother and he went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judah in place of his father Herod, so one of Herod's sons is now the governor of Judah, Judea, he was afraid to go there. So he was afraid to go to Judea. In other words, he, was, he had planned to go back to Judea, back to Bethlehem. But he didn't because of this dream. And having been, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, back up north where his hometown was. So he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So get the timeline. They went to Bethlehem. Jesus was born. At some point, the wise men come. They are warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. Joseph is warned in a dream to flee to Egypt. And so they flee to Egypt. Um, I think there's enough context here to, to say that that took place in Bethlehem, not Nazareth. So I think the wise men did come to Bethlehem. Now, how long after Jesus was born, we don't know. But I do think they came to Bethlehem because that's where 
Joseph was planning to return to, and then he decided or got information and went up to Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what was said through the prophet, he will be called a Nazarene. Um, that word fulfilled is actually used 12 times by Matthew in these birth narratives. And just this, these two chapters where he talks about the birth of Jesus, he uses that word fulfilled. And he talks about how all these things that have been prophesied in the Old Testament about the birth of Christ were fulfilled in Christ. For example, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that was fulfilled. That he would come out of Egypt, that was fulfilled. That he would be called a Nazarene, that would be fulfilled. That he would come from Galilee, all those, those four geographical locations um, that seem to contradict each other in the, in, the, in the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah come together and we see how Jesus fulfills them, oh, fulfills them all. All right, so back to the story. So where are we? The Magi have come, to, and they've told Herod, we're looking for the king. He found out that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. He sends them to Bethlehem. Verse, verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Now, how that happened, how that worked, I don't know. I don't know if the star that they had seen, the Lord caused the light to appear in a different way and it moved. If it was cloudy and the light and the light came through the clouds like a, a light, a flashlight on, on the ground, showing them where to go, and then then it's then it's shown down because of the break in the clouds, right exactly where Jesus was. I don't know. It may have been an angel holding a lantern. Going ahead of, I don't know how, how God did that, but I know God did that. Um, and he showed them exactly where they needed to go. When they saw the star, verse 10, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, so they're not in the, they're not in the manger, they're not in the stable, they're at a house, probably in Bethlehem. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. And they presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And then Joseph has the dream and they go to Egypt and then they come back. Now, I mentioned that perhaps God might be foreshadowing something here about the second coming. And I think it's in this last part where they bow down and worship him and open these treasures of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now there was a practical reason why they came as well. Um, obviously Joseph was going to need some funding, some finances to, to make this trip that he wasn't planning on making that he didn't know about. He had to, to change his plans in the middle of the night because of this dream. He had to immediately obey. Um, think about think about that immediate obedience. We, we kind of think about the immediate obedience of Abraham when he, when he was told to take his son Isaac and go and sacrifice. It says the next day he got up and he went. And Joseph gets this dream. Uh, he gets this message from the Lord. I want you to do this. He immediately goes. Um, and, and he would have needed some finances to make this trip, plus to live in Egypt and, and you know set up a house there or whatever he needed to, to get started in Egypt and live there for two years. Um, and so God provides what he needs. Uh, that's one of the ways we, we can know God will provide all of our needs. We, there's many times we don't know how it's going to work out. How's this going to happen? How's God going to take care of us? But he does. And he did for Joseph and Mary and provided them a, a practical reason. But there's more here than just a practical um, meeting of needs, I think. What, what's the other mystery that God might be showing us here? Well, I think it has to do with the inclusion of the Gentiles. That's a great mystery that... Uh, uh, was not really readily seen by even those who studied the scriptures diligently. That was something that Paul didn't see. That was something that Peter didn't see until God revealed it to them. And they spent, Paul especially spent a great deal of his writing trying to explain this mystery that had been hidden, that God was going to include the Gentiles. But here in the, in the birth narratives, probably the first believers um, who believed that he was the Messiah are Mary and Joseph, the next were probably the shepherds, um, the poor, the downtrodden, and the next group is, is these Gentiles. So God is showing us 
This story, this is good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The inclusion of the Gentiles uh, is a piece of it. But there's more to it than that even. Um, I think the Lord is showing us something else that's going to happen even future to us. Let me read to you something from Revelation. The very last uh, book in the Bible, and this is the very next to the last chapter in the book of Revelation. This is Revelation 21. This is after um, the thousand years, after the Satan is released, after the Satan is, is destroyed, even after the new heaven and the new earth come and the new Jerusalem comes. And so here we have Jesus on the throne, ruling and reigning in his new creation. Um, and here's what it says. He who, this is Revelation 21, 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So this plan of redemption that's been, been in effect since Genesis 3 uh, finds fulfillment here at the very close of Scripture. It says, I, I'm redeeming and renewing everything new. He says, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's verse 5. Let me skip over to verse 22. John's describing the city. And here's what he sees. He says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God, God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord gives it light, and the Lamb is its light. Nations will walk by this light, and the kings of the earth will bring all their glory and splendor into her, into the city, to give to the Lamb sitting on the throne. So almost the very, there's just a couple paragraphs left in, the, in Scripture. We see the kings of the earth bringing treasure, bringing gold, and, and, and coming and bowing down and worshiping the Lamb. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Um, Zechariah records some of this for us too. I'm going to go back to Zechariah 14. If you're in Matthew, it's just about 10 pages to the left to get back into Zechariah 14. And Zechariah 14, um, 12, 13, 14 is all about the second coming. It's all about Jesus appearing. It's all about the tribulation and, and what's the terrible things that are happening in Jerusalem. And chapter 14 opens with terrible, terrible things coming upon Jerusalem, the end of the, the tribulation period. The nations are destroying her, sacking her. Um, they are looting her. It says the, splend the, the plunder is being taken out of Jerusalem and divided by these nations. And so that's what's taking place just prior to Jesus showing up. Then Jesus shows up and this great reversal happens. And now the plunder is not being taken out of Jerusalem. The wealth and the glory is coming into Jerusalem. And at the end of chapter uh, 14, uh, listen to this. This is 1416. Then the survivors from all the nations that had attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship at Jerusalem, to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the feast. And so you have got these Gentile nations that previously had attacked and sacked and plundered Jerusalem. Now the things have turned and they're coming to Jerusalem to bring their wealth and their glory and their splendor to the king, Jesus, who's there just like the wise men. Just like the wise men, right? Who came um, from the nations around and they brought their, their wealth and they bowed down and they worshiped and they presented him offerings and gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so we see that happening um, when Jesus takes his throne again at the second coming. One last, one last place that I want to show you is in Isaiah 60. Um, let me just talk a little bit about Isaiah, because Isaiah is one of those places where God weaves these little threads of prophetic foreshadowing throughout the whole book. And that's not primarily what the book is about. I don't want to make a doctrine out of that. But that's, a, that's kind of this neat little facet of Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters. And the Bible has 66 books. And in the book of Isaiah, if you're paying attention, every so often, God just salt and peppers. He just throws in this little prophetic piece. And he does it in almost a chronological way 
so that the timeline of the gospel is laid out for us kind of behind the scenes, behind the curtain in the book of Isaiah. And so it's about Jerusalem, it's about Israel, it's about what's going on in Isaiah's time, but there's, there's this other little piece that's happening uh, behind the scenes. Like in Isaiah 9, where he talks about people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And he talks about unto us a child is given, unto us a son is born. I guess it's the other way around. Unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given. And then it jumps ahead from his first coming to his second coming. Then the government will be upon his shoulders and he'll be the Prince of Peace. And so we get those, those two comings. Uh, Isaiah saw it like mountain peaks in the distance and they were very close together. But we know that there's at least 2,000 years between the two mountains. And then as you work your way through Isaiah, he, he salt and peppers, he, you can see John the Baptist. You see prophecies about John the Baptist. You see prophecies about uh, Jesus coming and teaching and doing all kinds of different things. By the time we get to Isaiah 53, we have that very detailed prophetic description of the crucifixion where he's bruised for our transgressions and he's wounded for our iniquities right and Isaiah 53 is there's no way to read that and not see the crucifixion how he was despised and rejected he talks about his his beard being pulled out um, and by his stripes we are healed um, there's there's some prophecies in there about the coming of the Holy Spirit and by Isaiah 55 56 57 there's these repeated little pieces thrown in about the inclusion of the Gentiles, how he's, he's going to bring in all nations and all the peoples are going to come, right? Um, and so there's this, this very cool timeline that's stretched out across Isaiah. When we get to Isaiah 60, Isaiah 60 opens, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, thick darkness is over the people. It's almost word for word what he said in Chapter 9, before he announced the coming of Jesus as a child, as a son. But here he's talking about this time of thick darkness that will be over the earth when Jesus comes again. Nations, this is verse 3, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. It's always kind of irked me a little bit when I sing We Three Kings because in the back of my mind I go, yeah, they weren't, they were, first of all, there wasn't three. We don't know how many there were. They think there was three because of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but it could have been 50. We don't know how many wise men came. But we three kings, well, I, I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, they weren't kings. But I think that's not a bad rendering because it is this foreshadow of the kings who will come to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar. Your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. I think that's the city of Jerusalem looking upon uh, the Jewish people coming. It's, it's, but more than that, it's Jesus. Jesus who has desired this wedding with his bride and he sees the bride coming from, from not only the sons and daughters of Israel, but look what it says. It says, then, then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. That's how the Lord feels about you coming to him. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. The riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels. Man, when you see a when you see a nativity set, what do you always see with the wise men? You see a camel. There's always a camel that has brought the wise men. Well, that's accurate not only about what what happened then, but what's going to happen in the future. Herds of camels. Um, and it talks about all the things, the offerings that will come into the city and come to him. Verse 10, foreigners will, will be re rebuild your walls and the kings will serve you. And then he says about Jerusalem, though in anger I struck you, in favor I now show you compassion. Your gates will always stand open. They will be open day and night. That's exactly the language that John used when he talked in, in Revelation 21 about 
the, the king's coming with the, it says the city will never close. The gates will be open because men, here's what it says, verse 11, men will bring the wealth of the nations and the kings will lead in triumphal procession. I believe that that, that narrative of, of the wise men coming was God showing us that in the end, this is what will happen. The kings, the, the wise men, the, the, the leaders of all the nations will come and they will bow down and they will worship and they will open their treasures and give them in tribute to Jesus on the throne. Now, how's that an encouragement to us today? Well, I don't know about you, but every time I, I turn on the news or, or scroll through social media, there's a lot about the mess that the government is in, the mess that the world governments are in, the mess that our government is in, the mess that is, is the election, the mess that is what's happened. And it can get real discouraging. But what we need to remember is there is a king and he's on the throne right now. And he's promised that he's going to come back and he's going to straighten out everything. He's going to establish justice. He's going to establish peace. The government will be upon his shoulders. And of his peace, there will be no end. His reign will be forever. I'm looking for a, a city. And it's not Washington, D.C. And I'm looking for a leader. And it's not any of the ones that are on the horizon now. A king who's coming. Who's going to make everything new. And he's going to restore all things. He's going to restore me. Spiritually. Emotionally. Mentally. Relationally. Physically. Every. There'll be no sickness. No crying. There'll, there'll never be a separation. There'll never be a goodbye again. It'll be everything personally will be restored and then everything globally will be restored. He's going to restore all things. So this Christmas, as we celebrate, I want to encourage you to celebrate. And to celebrate the restoration of all things. And maybe... When you say Merry Christmas, at least in the back of your mind, and maybe at the front of your lips, say Mary Nantha, Mary Nantha, come Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen.